This is Selma Shemmel for the Group Room in Chicago at the annual AACR meeting. AACR is the American Association for Cancer Research, and we continue our discussion now with Dr. also Professor Joseph Lubed. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? You are the president of the International Liver Cancer Association. That's right. Professor of Medicine and director of the Mount Sinai Liver Cancer Program. Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, professor of research in the liver unit at the hospital clinic in Barcelona, Spain. What are some of the causes or risk factors for primary liver cancer? Yeah, in, we are lucky enough in a sense that we know 90% of the underlying risk factors of HCC. The number one is hepatitis B virus infection. Uh, accounts for 50% of the cases. Number two is hepatitis C virus infection that is more, more common in the US and Europe. Then we have 10% of the cases related to alcohol intake. And then another 10% of a mixture of other causes, one of which is very important in the US and it's growing, that is obesity associated with diabetes. What about environmental exposures to toxins and things like that? These are cofactors. For instance, uh, tobacco is a cofactor, increases the risk uh, around mm, twofold, uh, but it's not primarily uh, a theology of HCC. Uh, the same happens with aflatoxin, is a toxin produced by a fungi uh, in, that grows in humid conditions, particularly in Asia. Um, and, and the patients uh, acquire this, uh, so eating some um, food, and then it produces a mutation in p53 and increases the incidence of HCC. But it directly is not producing the tumor. Does the liver not uh, rejuvenate? Yes, it so does. So there is a, a, a constant process of necrosis regeneration, necrosis, regeneration. So the, the hepatitis B and C virus infect the cells, destroy the cells, necrosis, and then the liver regenerates to replace these cells. And this constant process throughout 20 years leads to a chronic infection and inflammation called cirrhosis. So, hypothetically, if you were to cut out the cancer, yes, the liver wouldn't grow back what you've removed in a healthy way. No, it will not. So, um, so if you are resecting a tumor in a patient with cirrhosis, the the liver is uh, can replace that, but very difficultly. It's it's different in a healthy individual in which, for instance. Uh, we, we are treating patients with liver transplantation mm -hmm. that can be from deceased donor or from living donor. Mm -hmm. So from a living donor, we are taking 60% of the volume of the liver of a healthy individual mm -hmm. and we're putting that in, in the receptor, the recipient, and we're removing the whole liver of the recipient. And this 60% growth the first month and acquires the volume, 100% of the volume, because the liver is healthy. You understand what I mean? Yes. And yes. at the same time, the donor in which you are leaving 40% of the volume, in one month, this 40% uh, is able to grow and, and replace the whole volume of the liver. So in one month, if you are performing CT scan or MRI, you can check that 95% of the volume is there already. So in if one we, month? In one month, anatomically, 90 per, 95%. Wow. wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's impressive. It's very impressive. Since our liver acts as a, it's a filtering organ, what about all of the medications uh, that people take? Are there risks with all, so much and more and more uh, synthetic things and processed things that yes. have to be filtered through the liver. Yes, uh, only few uh, drugs have been related to the development of liver cancer, particularly androgens. Um, and, and this is very uncommon, I have to say, in the epidemiology of the disease. So, uh, 
first of all, androgen induce a perineoplastic disease called hepatic adenoma, and a few proportion of these adenomas ultimately develop uh, cancer. So it's not very common that uh, this type of etiology in, in the area of HCC. Talk to us, please, about the treatment of liver cancer. Currently, in the U.S. and Europe, 30 to 40 percent of our patients can be treated with potentially curative therapies, meaning resection. Liver transplantation is the only solid tumor that can be treated with a transplant, and local ablation, mostly with radiofrequency. This accounts for 30 to 40 percent of our patients nowadays. Then 20 percent of the patients are diagnosed at what we call intermediate stage and are treated with chemoembolization. Uh, meaning mm, delivery of chemotherapy locally in the tumor. And then 40% of the patients in the West are diagnosed at advanced stage of the disease, and they may benefit from a molecular target therapy called sorafenib um, that uh, we demonstrate uh, three years ago that can expand uh, the life expectancy of the patients by blocking several pathways that promote the progression and dissemination of the disease. Dr. Lubed, what about, or Professor Lubed, what about the issue of metastatic liver cancer? Patients often will say, I have liver cancer, and then it takes a minute to figure out, oh, you have a different primary cancer that metastasized to your liver. In reality, this is a secondary liver cancer, it's called and then the etiology varies from breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. So in these cases, the disease in the liver should be treated as a per the primary tumor. So if you have a breast cancer with liver metastasis, you should uh, consider first uh, the drugs that uh, are active for the primary tumor, and then also consider, depending on the number of nodules in the liver to perform resection or local ablation specifically of the nodules. But the primary oncologists that deal with liver metastasis are the ones dealing with the primary tumor. Knowing that some of these liver cancers are tied to exposure to viruses and such, yes. what about prevention? Yeah, that's a very important point. So the vaccination with hepatitis B virus infection is critical. It was demonstrated 30 years ago that universal vaccination of infants with hepatitis B virus infection was able to prevent HCC after 20 and 30 years. And it's highly recommended by guidelines vaccination, universal vaccination of hepatitis B and C to B, sorry, to all infants. Regarding hepatitis C, unfortunately, we don't have vaccine at this point, but the new antivirals and polymerase inhibitors achieve curation of hepatitis C virus infection in up to 70% of the cases. So there is also this important advancement that has occurred very recently. I'd like to ask you about what a patient who's diagnosed with liver cancer needs to know, first of all, what is the sort of specialist they need to go see? Because I would think this is a very, very specialized area of yeah, medicine. It's a very specialized area, and all the guidelines recommend to send the patient to multidisciplinary groups. So each uh, university has multidisciplinary uh, liver cancer programs that are led by either hepatologists, oncologists, or surgeons mostly but all of them work together. I recommend to send a patient to one of these uh, referral centers in which you have the best radiologists, the best pathologists, and the best interventional oncologists there. Thank you, a professor and physician, Joseph Lubed, president of the International Liver Cancer Association, professor of medicine, director of the Mount Sinai Liver Cancer Program, Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, and Professor of Research in the Liver Unit at the Hospital Clinic in Barcelona, Spain. My pleasure. Thank you for helping us understand a bit more about liver cancer and what the future holds. Thank you very much.